In humans, the sleep and wake cycle is called the circadian rhythm. So it's a 24-hour cycle in which we sleep and we wake up. So a person who is awake is in a state of readiness and able to consciously respond to many different types of stimuli. EEG recordings show that the cerebral cortex is very active when a person is awake and fewer impulses are processed during most stages of sleep. So how does your nervous system respond to this and how does it transition between being asleep and awake? Well, it does so because of the reticular activating system. Remember we discussed this when we looked at functional brain areas. So the reticular activating system is help or is the part of the brain that helps us to maintain a state of being conscious and aware. So when this area is active, there are many nerve impulses being transmitted all throughout the cerebral cortex, both directly and also through the thalamus, remember, which was our relay station. Waking from sleep, also called arousal, involves increased activity in the reticular activating system. So for arousal to occur, the RAS has to be stimulated. So think about what stimulates you to wake up in the morning. It may be that horribly annoying alarm clock that's buzzing. Your phone may ring. You may move. Someone may touch you. You may have your arm is asleep because you've been lying on it. You may have a painful stimulus because you slung your arm over your head and hit the headboard. So regardless what it is, even if it's something as simple as the light coming in the window, the reticular activating system has been stimulated. Once it's activated, the cerebral cortex is also activated and arousal occurs. We wake up. The result of this is a wakeful state we call consciousness. Sleep is an altered state of consciousness or partial unconsciousness, but you can still be aroused pretty easily. Normal sleep consists of two components, non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement. So we'll look at the different components of each of those in just a moment, but before we do so, um, let's just look at another, uh, another term that is related to being aware, and that is coma. So coma is a state of unconsciousness from which an individual has little, if any, response at all to stimulus. The most common causes of coma uh, are going to be head injuries, uh, which can result in damage to the reticular activating system, infections within the brain, alcohol intoxication or drug overdose, so if the brain damage is minor or reversible, a person will usually come out of a coma and fully recover. If the brain damage is very severe and irreversible, it's unlikely that a person will recover. It's important here to point out, though, that people who are in a coma or even in what we call a persistent vegetative state when uh, the coma lasts for a long time and they're unable to speak or respond, even people that are in a long-term coma or persistent vegetative state are not dead. They're not brain dead because their EEG still shows activity, so it shows waveform. One of the criteria that's used to, to confirm brain death is to perform an EEG and you look for the absence of brain waves, which we commonly call flatline. Now let's look at the two stages of sleep. Your non-rapid eye movement consists of four uh, stages that differ just a little bit based on um, how deep you're asleep and what your brain is doing. So stage one is a transition stage between wakefulness and sleep. Usually lasts uh, one to seven, eight minutes. You are fully relaxed, eyes closed, still have a few thoughts going through the brain. People awakened during this stage often say, I wasn't asleep. Stage two, sometimes called light sleep, is the first stage of true sleep. This is when a person is still easy to awaken. Fragments of dreams may be experienced 
and the eyes may roll from side to side. Okay, stage three is a period of moderately deep sleep. Body temperature and blood pressure decrease. It's a little more difficult to awaken someone in this stage. It usually lasts about, uh, or usually occurs about 20 minutes after falling asleep. And stage four is the deepest level of sleep. And even though the brain metabolism decreases significantly, body temperature drops slightly at this point, but most reflexes are still intact and muscle tone is only slightly decreased. During this stage, however, though, it's usually very difficult to wake a person. So several psychological changes happen during non-REM sleep as well. Uh, slight decreases in heart and respiration rate and blood pressure. Muscle tone decreases, but very slightly. Um, so this allows you to still be able to move uh, as you are in this non-REM sleep because you still have control over your muscle tone. Dreaming sometimes takes place here, but only occasionally, so usually not most of your dreaming. Um, and when you do have dreams here in your non-REM, they're usually less emotional, less vivid, and perhaps even logical. Doesn't sound like much of a dream there, right? During REM sleep, rapid eye movement, the eyes are moving rapidly back and forth under the eyelids. EEG readings show high frequency waves, very similar to those of a person who's awake. Neuronal activity is high, blood flow and oxygen use in the brain are high. But despite all this, it's usually still very hard to wake a person during REM sleep. There are several things going on physiologically with the body as well, such as an increase in heart and respiration rates, blood pressure increase, significant decrease in muscle tone, and sometimes even what we call sleep paralysis. This is the period during REM sleep, of course, where most dreaming occurs. Brain imaging studies have shown that during REM sleep, there's increased activity in the visual association area, Remember, that's the part of the brain that helps us recognize visual images. The limbic system, which that's our seat of emotion, and decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex. Remember, that's where we reason. This might help to explain why some of our dreams are pretty bizarre, bizarre right? Things don't make sense. We're not thinking logically. Um, during REM sleep, Erection of the penis and enlargement of the clitoris may occur, even when the dream is not sexual. So the presence of penile erections during REM sleep in a man uh, with erectile dysfunction or the inability to attain an erection when he's awake indicates that his problem is probably psychological, not something physical, or he wouldn't be able to achieve that erection during the sleep. Uh, so intervals of REM and non-REM alternate throughout the night, so we move from stage to stage. In adults, REM sleep totals about two to three hours during a typical eight-hour sleep period. But as you age, the total time spent sleeping decreases, so so does the REM sleep. Sleep is essential to normal brain functioning. Think about when you've been sleep deprived. You had to work a long shift and go to class and then you get home and you have to study and the kids are screaming and man, you ended up getting maybe an hour of sleep. And then the next day you start again. By the end of that second day, man, we're moody, we're depressed, we're unable to deal with emotions, we're hangry. So even though we really don't understand everything that sleep does, we do know that sleep deprivation impairs us, impairs attention and mood and performance. If the lack of sleep is long enough, it can lead to hallucinations and yeah, even death. There has been quite a bit of debate about the importance of sleep and what its functions are. So everyone agrees that sleep is essential to humans, but not everybody's quite sure why we need to sleep. So the debates in the scientific community have centered around some of the proposed functions of sleep. These are pretty widely accepted. And that is restoration or providing the body time to repair itself. 
um, consolidation of memories, taking the things that we've learned and seen and experienced throughout the day and processing those and putting them into storage, uh, enhancing the immune system, allowing the body to sort of survey what's going on and to make appropriate responses, and maturation of the brain. So being able to form new synapses and again to make those connections. So several things can interfere with the functioning of the brain such as alcohol and sleep medications that can change the patterns um, of our normal REM versus non-REM sleep. Infants you'll notice will sleep a lot more than adults uh, 16 to 20 hours a day. Adults, yeah, if we get a good 7 to 9 hours we're pretty good. Unfortunately though as you age, the amount of sleep you get declines. It becomes much, much harder to sleep and sleep orders may develop as well. Our sleep disorders may develop as well. Sleep disorders affect over 70 million people in the United States each year. Common sleep disorders include insomnia, sleep apnea, and narcolepsy. A person suffering from insomnia has difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or perhaps both. Some of the most common causes of insomnia include stress or drinking too much caffeine throughout the day, cut back on your coffee. Anything that disrupts the normal circadian rhythm, such as you're working the night shift instead of your normal day shift, or you go to an area where you have a lot of darkness, such as Alaska, where there are prolonged periods of dark. Um, this can lead to depression as the brain starts to um, get imbalances of some of the neurotransmitters that are associated with light and dark, such as melatonin and serotonin. Sleep apnea is a disorder where you stop breathing throughout your sleep period, usually for 10 or more seconds. Most often it occurs because of a lack of muscle tone in the muscles associated with the pharynx and that allows the airway to collapse during sleep. A lot of times you will find snoring often occurs uh, in those suffering from sleep apnea as well. Narcolepsy is a condition where the REM sleep can't be inhibited throughout the time when you're supposed to be awake. So because of that you have involuntary periods of sleep that may last about 15 minutes or so throughout the day. There have been some studies done recently of people that are suffering from narcolepsy and it's shown that there is a protein, a neuropeptide, remember that's a one of our uh, neurotransmitter types, so it's a protein neurotransmitter called orexin um, that's released from certain neurons of the hypothalamus that help to promote wakefulness. So there are new pharmaceuticals, new drugs um, that contain orexin or orexin mimics that are uh, supposed to help you be able to sleep better. Now, any time that you're relying on uh, a, a supplement or a medication to help you to sleep, you can become dependent on those and also build up a tolerance to those. So if you're using anything to help you sleep, whether it's alcohol, it's over-the-counter, or it is prescription drugs, make sure that your doctor's aware of that uh, and can monitor you carefully with those.